Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. This is going to be our first of many videos for the question and answer series. Okay, People ask me questions. Like I said, there's three types of answers I can have. I can have the wrong answer. I can have the right answer. And I'll answer, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to do my best that I'm not going to just give you an answer to give you an answer. Okay, that's the thing. You can have people that they'll have the wrong answer, they'll have the right answer, or they'll say, I don't know. Those are the three types of Overall, if you were to sum it up, the type of answers you can get from people. I'm going to try to give you the right answer. <laughs> and then if I don't know, I'm not going to just try to give you an answer that might be a wrong answer. I'm going to try to say, I don't know. Okay, because there's some things I don't know. Right? So, uh, we got an email for the first one. And it says, hello, and it's from a brother in Christ. Right? Starts out saying, I hope it's alright that I have a few questions. And due to the character constraints in the comment sections on Rumble... I figure it may be more prudent to just send an email. So when I uploaded the same video that I did on YouTube on Rumble, I gave the ministry email and he emailed the ministry a few questions. And they're really good questions. So uh, we'll get with the first one. The first one says, how do you highlight scripture? What do, what do certain colors mean? What purpose do they serve? I myself, when I was saved by the grace of God this past February, praise the Lord, decided to highlight everything in yellow that seemed important or I thought I ought to remember and memorize. That problem with that is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, so it's all important. Yes, it is, but I'll help, I'll help out in a second. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There's four colors you can use. All scriptures given by inspiration, for, which I, I, I didn't do it that way, but I'm just saying, yes, all scripture is important, but it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay? So it's all important. Most of the pages I have read are just colored in yellow, so it's now doing me a disservice because they are all the same. How do you highlight? Okay? I'm going to go through some of my books, uh, Bibles that I have. First things first, this, I'm going to use this because I don't have my very first King James Bible that I bought. Okay, I gave it away to someone professing to be saved and that person destroyed it by not taking care of it. Okay? You can tell a lot from a brother and sister in Christ or from someone who cares about God's Word by how they take care of their Bible. And don't get me wrong, as the years go by, some of these Bibles have gotten wrinkles in some of the pages. Uh, some of the leather on the outside is seen in wear and tear and everything. Uh, especially on the ones I use a lot, but you can also tell if someone's even using their Bible by how much the by the layer of dust that you find on their Bible. Okay, but my biggest thing is, is please how you treat the Word of God physically oftentimes reflects how you treat the Word of God in a lot in your life as a Christian. If this is just sitting there gathering dust, okay then you're really not taking it that seriously. There's some people that have it opened up and they don't really take care of it and the pages are ripped. Um, this person that I gave my first Bible to, uh, her original Bible looked like a cheap Bible, but it had pages ripped out that she had stuffed in here and all this stuff. It just looked horrible. And I was like, well, I gave her my first Bible that I got because I bought a second Bible that was a little bit bigger print. Uh, so I could see better. And, gosh, within three, three months, the brand new Bible. And I gave her an expensive Bible. An expensive Bible that's supposed to last your generation, your son's generation, your son's, to, to, to your grandson, in other words. That's how well these Bibles are put together. This one's kind of an older one. The paper's a little bit not as strong as the paper in these. So... This one would be more of a uh, one of the cheaper versions, which is okay. But it started to look like the original Bible she had after about four four months. So they didn't take care of it. Okay, there's a lot to be said about someone who takes care of your Bible, and then you get those people that'll say, "Well, marking your Bible up isn't taking care of it." Okay, please, I'll show you uh, close up pictures. Even though I'm talking about it right here, I'll try to put pictures up here on the screen that uh, as we go through some of these Bibles, right? Uh, dust on the Bible, we talked about that. Is there dust on the Bible? There's dust on your walk with God. Think about it, brothers and sisters Christ. If there's dust on the Bible, there's dust on your walk with the Lord. And that's so true. Mm -hmm. If it is mistreated and trashed, 
That will be how your life reflects your belief in the Word of, of your life. Like I said, I'm not saying this is an idol. I'm just saying how you take care of God's Word. Okay? There's some people who throw it around. There's some people who it just gathers dust on the, on the desk. This book, when you buy a brand new King James Bible, if it's 10 years old, it shouldn't look brand new. It's pristine. Please, don't, I'm not saying it should. It's not going to look pristine. If it does, that's probably because it's just been sitting on the shelf somewhere. And it's useless just sitting on a self shelf somewhere. But at the same time, I've seen people where they just trash their Bibles. They, you know, I don't know how they do it sometimes. I really don't. I, I, I open these books. We're going to go through them. I open these books and I go through them. And I read them a lot. I highlight. I write in little notes. And my Bibles do not look as bad as some of these people's Bibles that I've seen that claim to love the Word of God. But physically, they can't treat it right. Okay? I remember, I'm not talking about salvation. Okay, I say professing Christian because sometimes I've given Bibles to people, King James Bible to people that I thought were saved that aren't saved, and sometimes I've given to people that are saved that are just struggling with the flesh. Okay, you're always going to have that in life. But um, I did okay, and now I did a video, but I'll go ahead and talk about it here. The reason I'm using this because my first Bible that I gave away, I didn't do any writing in it whatsoever. I was just so excited. I got, uh, God brought me to the truth through King James Video Ministries. I started watching all the Bible version issue videos that he had, and I got really excited. Bought me, it was a nice black one like this, but I'm using this as an example because I gave away my first Bible. And I, I bought a lot of Bibles for people. And I'm st I'll still do that. This ministry will still buy Bibles for people that I can. Usually it's in the United States. I usually have a hard time trying to ship stuff overseas. Um, and a lot of the uh, church Bible publishers here in America won't ship overseas. So I can't, you know, pay for it and have it shipped to you. Um, I have to take a box and try to ship it myself. Uh, but my first Bible, I got so excited. Okay, this King James Bible, I watched the Bible version issue. It didn't take long for me to say, hey, this is God's perfect written word. All the other Bibles I had, I was lied to. They're fakes. They're frauds. This, is, this comes from the Texas Receptus, which comes from Antioch, okay, where Christians are first called Christian. The Antioch mentality is that there's a perfect written word of God out there, and I have it, King James Bible. Okay. So, and all the other Bibles come from Alexandria, Egypt, from the Nestles of Law in Alexandria, Egypt. It didn't take long for me to come to this. So when I first got saved and I started going through eternal security videos, salvation videos, uh, pre-time of Jacob's trouble videos, instruction righteousness videos. I was just following along and really excited. Okay, I got the real, the real Word of God. God saved me. He's opening the Scriptures to me. And that's what I was doing at first. Then God put it on my heart and said, Hey, why don't you highlight? So, what I did was, is at first my daughter, at the time, she was into art and doing art. So she had this huge pencil, like a, a wooden case that opens up. And it had paint, different types of oil paints, regular paints, um, and all these pencils that were light. They were almost like charcoal pencils um, for drawing, coloring, and everything. And I asked if I could have a few because they had, she had every color. Like looks like three of every color, but she said they're different shades. <laughs> but to me, I'm not an artist, so it's like, take her word for it. So I borrowed a few pencils from her, and I've got them in the other room where I have my stand where I do my color, uh, highlighting. And when I bought this King James Bible from the lo local uh, church Bible publishers, I started highlighting things in it. And what I did was, is what you always need to do to help you out, Brother in Christ that's asking this question, and anybody else just like the video I did. Um, well, I'll show a picture of it. But you do a ledger. What a ledger is, like a key to a map. So what it does is it tells you what all the symbols are on the map, what it means. So you make a ledger where you write down all the different topics you want. My first Bible that I did was this red was salvation message. Yellow was learning and correction. In other words, instruction and righteousness. And I even added judging to it because you can add judging to the side. I mean, you can start adding things to the list of the colors. But the thing is, is you don't have to follow my colors. You can use any color you want. But what you need to do is make a ledger at the very front of your Bible that says, okay, for what for this subject is, anytime the Bible talks about this subject, I'm going to highlight it in this color. So anytime it starts talking about salvation message, okay, I did it in red. That's for this book, okay. 
false converts I didn't read also. So it kind of confuses you. So this, like I said, this was a, a, a first attempt. We'll get into this, the, the last attempt that I did. But salvation message, red. Uh, instruction righteous, learning Christian, I did yellow. Eternal security, I did salvation. So any verse you come across that's eternal security, it's, it's orange. So when I flip through this book to read it, and I see orange, it automatically hits my head and my heart. Hey, that, there's a, that's an uh, uh, eternal security passage proving that we have eternal security for today. Okay. Uh, I, of course, I did silver. I chose silver because the word is like silver tried in the fire seven times. Okay, purify it in the fire seven times. So I used silver or gray, whichever you have, and I did for the written word. So anytime it's pushing the written word, these things have I written. I highlight that part in, in um, silver. And then other parts where it says the word, silver. Uh, uh, I'll worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thy word, I would highlight that in yellow. Um, uh, the word uh, in Hebrews where it talks about the word being likened to a sword, a double-edged sword. I highlighted that whole thing, silver. Talking about the word of God, piercing even asunder and knowing the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. Uh, what I did on this one when I first started out was key scriptures. I did green. Okay. Uh, like abstain from all appearance of evil. Second Timothy two fifteen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Okay. Uh, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee okay? and then so on and so forth there's a lot of that the Lord helped me memorize um, but I did those in green uh, the Godhead I did in blue uh, pre-time of Jacob's trouble anything that had to do with Jacob's trouble pre, mid, towards the end I highlighted it in purple so the, the key here is to keep it from just all being one color. That would be confusing. Well, what's the difference? Um, but you make a ledger at the very front of your book, of your Bible. And you don't even have to write in the Bible. If you want to do a piece of paper and do a, co a ledger on the piece of paper and put in here, but you might lose the piece of paper. So you have a lot of blank white pages at the very beginning of the Bible. Pick one and, build, and make yourself a ledger and make sure you have all the pencils. Um, so, so, I'll go back to the pencils. Uh, I don't know if I can open this, but what I recommend here, it says that it is the premium color pencil set, 48 color pencil storage case sharpener. Um, the biggest thing that you look for when you look for pencils, color pencils, it says soft and smooth application. You want soft color pencils. And when you feel the tip, it just, it just feels soft, like uh, chalk. Okay? That's what you want, because that won't damage the pages, won't be ripping through the pages or anything. Because um, with the, uh, so you, that's what you want there. So color it free. Your creativity is the brand that I bought. But this has tons. It has 48 color pencils. And I only pulled out when I get this one. I'll show you this one. Um, I think I'm using 12 colors, maybe, now that I've upgraded and said, okay, Lord, I don't want green for, uh, uh, um, when I first started out, there was scripture I needed to memorize, and then I kept adding scripture and adding scripture, but instead of doing key scriptures in green, I took that out completely and said, okay, we're just going to really try to separate all the different topics as much as we can. There's no perfect way to do it. There's no 100% right way to do it. You just pick out some topics. And you pick out colors for those topics and you make the ledger at the very beginning. But make sure it says soft and smooth application. Um, this is actually a case, if I can ever get it open. It's a black case that came with it. And then it holds all the different pencils in it. So there's still tons of different pencils. So if I want to do a second Bible, I can just pick different colors. And do another Bible. Okay. Um, I do it because when you highlight, you spend time reading the passages that you're highlighting. The colors determine what the subject's about, and it's just, it's what helps me. Okay. Now, this one I bought. <laughs> I'm a big proponent, please, brothers and sisters of Christ, understand. I'm a big pusher that if someone asks what kind of Bible that they should get, local church Bible publisher, King James Bible, you should get one that has no commentary. 
That's my advice. No commentary. Why? Because when a man's wrong, he's going to get you wrong. When he's right, he's right. But the problem is, is when he's wrong. Okay? Uh, there's nothing wrong with listening to other, like my preaching, Brother Brian's preaching, Brother JT, if he ever gets back into videos, um, Brad Avichine over at Cannibal KJV, or other brethren. There's nothing wrong with listening to other preaching. It's just what, when they start writing it down in a book and saying, this is what it means, what if they're wrong? But it's already written in here, okay? The other reason why I like the fact that it has no commentary or anything is then you have to look it up yourself. That's the whole point with 2 Timothy 2.15. You need to do the study, not have somebody else do it for you. Now don't get me wrong, in this book right here, as I'm going through, I'm writing in passages like, ver um, let's see if I can find one. I did it with Revelation a lot, where I wrote in a lot of passages where it said, hey, this verse over here helps reflect this verse. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, since it's a capital S Spirit, I colored it in uh, blue, because blue is the Godhead. I still kept blue. And it says, saith unto the churches, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. I highlighted, He that overcometh shall be hurt from the second death with green. So instead of using green for uh, key scriptures like I did in the first book, God put on my heart to use a color for different dispensations. So this says, Overcometh shall be not hurt of the second death. I don't have to overcome. But people in the time of Jacob's trouble does. So then I wrote in here, Revelation in pencil, just a pencil, Revelation 20, uh, 14. So you go over there and you see it again where it's pushing, hey, there's works in this time of Jacob's trouble. It's a different dispensation. It's a different plan of salvation. Faith and works. Okay? Um, so you can do that. But like I said, once again, the key to doing it is you have to have a ledger in the front. So I wrote a ledger down. And then for this final one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I used 10 colors. I thought it was 12. It's 10. It's a lot of colors. <laughs> um, for, once again, salvation and evidence of a changed life, I went ahead and added those two and made those red. So anytime passages talk about salvation or a changed life, I do it in red. Um, eternal security is orange still. Uh, instruction righteousness is yellow. Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, I did, it's kept it in purple. Uh, the word of God, silver. Godhead is blue. Uh, then I did a, um, the color of like vomit. I went ahead and went for a gray, something that was an ugly, uh, not gray, uh, brown. Uh, an ugly color like, like vomit. And the reason I did that was for false converts, lost people. And the Bible talks about lost people, you know, whose damnation is just. Right? When it talks about false converts... I highlight that in uh, brown to let me know that, hey, it's not talking about saved people. It's talking about lost people. Okay? And then, of course, dispensation and rightly dividing, I did green. So anytime it's a different dispensation, in Genesis, I highlighted um, the command that God gave uh, Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree. Why? Because that is the salvation in that dispensation. Okay? Here it is, uh, 2 Genesis 16. You can flip to it really quick when you have them highlighted different colors. Uh, 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That's a different dispensation. It's works. So I put a little red on there just to say it's a, sal it's a salvation, but then I did it in green, the whole passage in green, to show that it's a different dispensation, though. Okay? Today we're not saved by works. Uh, then I did a copper color for hell, Satan, and Antichrist. Anything that talks about hell, like destruction, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. Okay? They are the enemies of Christ, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. But there's another verse that says, whose damnation is just. Okay? 
But anytime it talks about hell, it talks about Satan, or it talks about the Antichrist slash Antichrist spirit that's in the world. Okay, I did that in copper. And then, uh, last one I just added, uh, I did one for the judgment seat and crowns of reward. Okay, I had to do that in a very, I did a dark, dark blue for Godhead, and I did this one in like a cloud sky blue, like a really, really light blue for um, judgment seat and crown of rewards to highlight that. But you might want to do it differently. You don't have to do it this way, Brother Sister Christ. It's just this brother's asking, uh, Brother Sister Christ is asking, um, what to do. If you just did it all in one color, it would be kind of confusing. And yeah, it would be like, well, what's the point? It's a good start, though. It's a good start to have that habit of, hey, I want to highlight things. But the best thing you need to do is take the front end, make a ledger, and start highlighting. And start saying, okay, this subject here, I want to start highlighting it this color. This subject here, this color. Go through the major doctrines. That's what I did. You have salvation, the true plan of salvation. The, the easy believers can't handle, but you highlight a lot of it in red, and you get verses galore that teach that there's repentance and true biblical repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You're either sorry for your sins, your personal sins that you've sinned against God, or you're so too sorry to let go of this world. Okay? And that's true biblical repentance, having true sorrow in your heart for your personal sins you've sinned against God, your Creator, God Almighty. Okay, that's why you're sorry for what Jesus went through, what He did for us on the cross, to pay for sins, your sins. Now, if you want your sins forgiven, you go to the cross. Okay, but there's major doctrine, salvation, eternal security is a major doctrine that I have a color for, instruction and righteousness. Okay, remember, all scriptures given is proper for, uh, proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. You can go all over the Bible. That's the color that you need at least like two or three pencils of that color because you're going to be going, oh, that's, that's the one I have highlighted the most is yellow. Okay? But um, salvation is a, is a key doctrine. Eternal security is a key doctrine. Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away of the body of Christ is a key doctrine. Godhead is a key doctrine. Dispensationalism, rightly dividing, is the key doctrine. Okay, um, the Word of God, the Bible version issue, is the key doctrine. Um, so a lot of this is doctrine, and then you have instruction and in righteousness. Okay, because judgment seat of Christ, and then the great white throne, the two different ones. Okay, um, their doctrine. So that's what you're really doing. Is you're listening out all these doctrines that are important, and that way you can highlight them. So when you flip through and open it up. You come across the color, you automatically see, okay, here's one right here. Acts 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. It says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise, uh, uh, Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bone received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered in with the with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. What do I have highlighted? I have it highlighted green. Well, you say, well, why is it green? Because the sign gifts were only there for a little bit. They're not here for today. Okay? There was a transition period between that. If you flip it open, here's yellow. Okay? And I have it highlighted in red a little bit. Because sometimes you're not just going to do it one color. You're going to have multiple colors. Okay? For one verse. You'll have it highlighted completely yellow for instruction righteousness. Then the, the number of the verse, 24, you'll highlight it red because there's a little part in there about salvation. But you've already highlighted it yellow, so then you can put a little highlight over the number 24, like for verse 24, and then you find out, well, there's also something in there that talks about a false convert. So then you can draw a box around the whole verse of brown. So now you got brown, red, and yellow. So it talks about salvation, it talks about false converts, it talks about instruction and righteousness. So you can have three topics in the same thing, and that's how I've been doing it in this final Bible, because this one is a huge print Bible, and I love it for my eyes. Um, the paper isn't as strong, though, but like I said, these pencils still work fine on this paper, because the bigger it is, the, the lighter weight paper they use. It, the coloring pencil was, works better on this, the medium size print because they put they use stronger paper 
On this one, the only difference is, is I'm learning how to, I have to do a box around the, the word or the, uh, the verse and then color it in because sometimes the black will bleed over a little bit, just a little bit. But it won't show once you get it done and get it really highlighted and everything. Then it doesn't show when you read. But when you're asking, I'll, like I said, that's what I do. Like I said, I get to Ephesus. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to take some pictures. I've been going through the expository studies that Brother Brian did. And I have been just highlighting galore. And hopefully someday this, most of this book will be highlighted. And if it gets totally highlighted, which if we're here that long, it gets highlighted big time. People say, what are you going to do? Well, like I said, I've got tons more pencils here. I might buy another Bible and start over. It keeps the Word of God in your head, and it helps you keep it in your heart. Because you're not just highlighting something. You're trying to highlight it a certain color because it means something, and you apply it to your life as a Christian. All right. So that's what I do with that one. Oops. That's how I'd answer that question. <laughs> Second question he asks is, how do you re recommend I go about memorizing scripture? Of course, as I read the Bible every day, I become more familiar, and it gets easier to find the precise verse I'm looking for. Is there anything else should, I should do beyond that? Now, like I said, that's a little confused, because there's memorizing scripture, and then you said, of course, as I read the Bible every day, I become more familiar, and it e gets easier to find the precise verse I'm looking for. As far as uh, I use on the computer, and I have, I didn't bring it out here, I didn't think to, um, I have a concordance, a book concordance, so you have paper that you can look for words, and for, uh, look up stuff in the, in the Bible, where this word is used at in the Bible. The online programs are a little bit more advanced because you can do phrases and whole sentences, uh, not just word by word, uh, which is the, oh, the old way where you have to do word by word and really go through a lot more scripture trying to find the ones you want. Um, but there's that way as far as uh, looking through. But when you're talking about memorizing scripture, uh, when I leave the house, anytime I leave the house, I make sure to put a stack of my mem uh, gospel tracts that I have here. But what I do is, is I make stacks. The same thing we just did with the highlighting in here. Eternal security. I try to make a, a stack of flashcards on verses for eternal security. Uh, salvation message. This is my salvation message and this is my key scripture. So I have a stack of key scriptures and salvation messages that I have here with me. But you do ones on eternal security. You do verses on the Godhead. You can make flashcards. And I put these in my back pockets anytime I leave the house. So when I go to the beach to go for a walk, I'm sitting there and I pull this out. And I start reading, walking along the beach. And I read and I talk to the Lord about them. And then I'll sit there and read them and try to, and try to quote them from memory. And then I'll start talking to the Lord about them again. Because bottom line, memorizing this isn't good enough. It doesn't do anything. There's, there's lost people out there that know how to memorize stuff. They can memorize scripture. It's when you memorize the scripture up here, and then you put it, let the scriptures make it down here. The Bible says, And thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. How do you make, how does you make sure that your walk with the Lord is strong? It's good. It's the right path. You're going the right direction. It's by hiding God's word here. Not here. Okay? So when you're memorizing scripture, you read it, and then you start talking to the Lord about it. Well, Lord, this applies, I've seen this, and, and this applies here. I've seen this apply there in my life. Lord, um, right here it says 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. I'm bad with addresses. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I'm supposed to be a soldier for Jesus Christ. He's my commander in chief. He tells me what to do. And I'm not supposed to be warring, entangling himself with the affairs of this life. Lord, look what's going on out there today. Look how distracted the body of Christ is getting with the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches and lusts of other things. We're not supposed to be, be entangled with the affairs of this life. And you start talking to the Lord about it, saying, Am I doing anything in my life where I'm getting entangled with the affairs of this life and I'm taking my eyes off Jesus and not keep I'm, and putting them on the world when my eyes need to remain on Jesus Christ? Okay. But this is how I memorize, because I have a bad memory. I had a major seizure disorder um, that really took its toll on my body, um, but also my brain. 
and God blessed me and healed me and got me and helped me memorize scripture. Okay, this to me is the best way I believe. You make flashcards and you go for walks. You don't have to drive to the beach. You don't have to drive to a park. You can get up and go walk around the backyard with these. You can go sit there and watch the sun go down with your flashcards and be reading them and talking to the Lord about them as the sun's going down. Let's say you live in the city, you know. You can sit inside somewhere with these and do the same thing. But you take time out with the Lord to memorize Scripture and talk to the Lord about Scripture, His Scriptures. Okay? This is what I do. Um, a sister in Christ suggested these. It's the same thing as the flashcards, only it's on a three, it's on a ring binder. So they're a lot easier to just flip it over. And then you flip it over. And then you flip it over. It's all, this is your one booklet. You don't have to worry about, like I use rubber bands and everything. This is all put together. And these was, that was a good idea too. And then you can do different stacks. And you just take these stacks and put them in your front pocket. Or like I like wearing my sweater that has a little pocket in front that you can put it in that pocket when you go for walks and stuff. And you flip through it. I don't care what people think. This is a crazy guy on the street or on the beach. What's he doing? He's talking to himself. I don't care. I'm talking with the Lord. Okay. That's the best way to memorize scripture. Read it constantly like uh, the, the brethren here was talking about. Call, uh, constantly read the Bible is going to help out too. Listening to Alexander Scorvey, that helps out too. I sit outside, especially with the Old Testament. I listen to the Old Testament over and over. Start from Genesis, getting all the way to the very end. Okay, and back again, just go back and forth, start all over, go through it again, start all over, go and I sit and I listen to it. I try to plan out every winter sitting there with Alexander Scorvey, and I'm, it's raining hardcore outside during the winters here, so I plan on sitting there with my Bible open and following along and reading it as Alex Scor Alexander Scorvey is reading it, and that's helped me get through the Old Testament a lot. Um, so yes, constant reading is going to help, absolutely. But I found this way helps out a lot when it comes to memorizing Scripture. Right. So, um, so to, to end off of that question, start your day with the Word and end your day with the Word. You're already doing that, but that's my advice to brethren too when it comes to memorizing Scripture. Start your day with the Word, end your day with the Word. Okay, flashcards while walking and talking with the Lord. In other words, go for a walks and talk with the Lord through memory verses. Okay, I started out when I did my first, um, this thing was very short, wasn't this thick. Um, it started out with Brother Brian's uh, key scriptures every Christian should know. When I was newly saved, this is what I did. I watched that study, I paused it, and I wrote out every verse that he put on there and said, these are key verses to help you start out with. They're just to start out with. Then over time, I've added a lot of scripture on top of that video. Okay. But my best advice, uh, I'll link it in the, hopefully remember to link it in the message below, that, uh, that uh, key scriptures every Christian should know. And highlight, like I said, make you a card starting out with those verses, and then from there you branch out. Like I said, you can start making different stacks for different doctrines. Okay. Instruction and righteousness, how you feel like you want to do it. But that's just been the best way for me. Mm -hmm. uh, third question he asked, How persistent should I be with sharing the gospel and other key matters with family, with my family? I'm going to stop there because he's going to give an example. But first of all, key matters. Be careful. The Bible talks about how we're not supposed to cast uh, pearls before swine. It says, Cast not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Okay, what's that mean? Uh, when it comes to salvation, we present salvation to lost people. But when it comes to Bible matters, I mean, you can tell them, hey, that's a sin because God said that's a sin. But when it comes to Bible matters, like doctrine and stuff like that, you're not supposed to be sharing it and discussing that with lost people. Okay, and I understand a lot of you already know that, brothers and sisters of Christ. But sometimes we have a lot, especially in these last days, we have a lot of professing Christians. Okay, so you might get slipped into talking about biblical matters that, um, oh gosh, that you're not supposed to be talking to them about it. They don't want the truth. But you get confused because you're like, oh yeah, that's right, they just profess to be saved. They're not really saved. And I need to go back to the basics, which is salvation. Always bring it back to salvation with them. Okay. 
For example, just the other night I explained just one of, of arguments why the KJV is the only Bible for English-speaking people, peoples to my mother, who is a charismatic, professing Christian, but I have my doubts if she's saved just by looking at her fruits. After all I said, she told me that I clearly... She told me that I clearly more scholar on the matter than she is, and she has nothing to add to it. She told me she'd reject any Bible that denies the deity of, Christ, of Jesus, but she won't let go of her precious Amplified Bible, which does deny the deity of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and they'll try to accuse the King James Bible as uh, downplaying the deity of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't. Okay, but all these other Bible perversions, it's so obvious that they do. Um, should I persist or leave her alone since she does, doesn't care to research this on her own at all? Well, I can go off of my experience. When I, I just explained it. When I was told about the Bible version issue, it didn't take me long to change. I was excited about it. I was looking for the truth. God gave me the truth. I bought a King James Bible. Okay, when you talk to somebody that's like, eh, meh. Okay, Titus 3 9 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogy, genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Verse 10 A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Well, when you read here, it said that she condemned herself. She, I'll read it again. She told me she'd reject any Bible that denies the deity of Jesus. And what she do? But she won't let go of her precious Amplified Bible. She's condemning herself. Okay? She's condemning herself. But I go on the rule there that man's a heretic of the first and second admonition reject. When you, most of the people that we try to reach today, it's just the way it is today. Everybody's heard of a Jesus Christ, but they don't. If ever they're not heard of, they haven't heard of the Jesus Christ. And when they do, nine out of ten times they reject him. It's that one out of ten times that we're desperate for in these last days. Okay. Everybody around the world has heard of a Bible, but they've never heard of the Bible, the Word of God, singular. Only one perfect book out there today in English. That's King James Bible. Proven time and time again for over 400 years, the fruits that come from this book. All right. But you say, how many times? Sharing the gospel with them? I would share the gospel with somebody once. And hear me out. Once. That's it. I'd go out of my way. Hear me out. I'd go out of my way to preach the gospel to somebody once. From that day forward, I'll wait for an open door. I'm not going to go to somebody and hammer them over, go out of the way to hammer people over and over the head with the gospel. Either they want it or they don't want it. Okay. A great example of this is Acts uh, chapter 17, verse 16. This is Paul. Okay. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, and when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, Therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the markets daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? You can have that reaction from people. Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, plural. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. He preached one God, but for some reason they keep coming across God's plural. One thing I'd have to say as a side note, you'll notice with the lost world, they cannot stand having one God. It always has to be God's plural. The Trinity, it's all about having God's plural. There's only one capital G God in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and that's the Father. God, the Father, is the one true God. Then you have the Son, capital S, Son of God. Jesus Christ. You have the capital S Spirit of God, the Father. And that's the Holy Spirit. There's only one capital G God. But for some reason, this world cannot handle having one God. They just can't handle it. They have to have their gods plural. So they could not understand what one God is for some reason. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto 
to Aragapus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speak, speaketh is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something, some new thing. I want to stop there for a second and try to encourage some of the men in ministry out there. Don't feel like you always have to have something new, new, new. There's plenty of doctrine to preach. There's plenty of instruction and righteousness to preach. The true plan of salvation. The Bible version issue. You don't always have to just feel like you've got to come out with something new, new, new. God will show you some new things from time to time. But don't be pressured like the lost world is. That something gets old, oh, it's old. I don't need to preach on it anymore. No, you should still be preaching on eternal security. You should still, I've already done 50 videos on it. Doesn't matter. You should still be preaching on it. Okay, same thing with pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ. Uh, instruction righteousness. Godhead. Okay, you need to keep preaching on these things all the time. Don't fall into the pressure like these guys are, the lost world, where we have to have something new. New, 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 new. It's always got to be new. Doesn't always going to have to be new. Okay, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars' heels and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, singular, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they may feel after Him, and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. That's the key there for this brethren here. Okay, that uh, are they seeking truth? Do they want truth? Are they seeking after the Lord? Or are they just brainwashed and going the way of the world, like for false converts? They're just so brainwashed and going the way of the world, and so flesh-driven. The Bible says, carnally minded and walking after the flesh. That's someone who's lost. A Christian is never going to be carnally minded. They'll have acts that might be carnal. They might have, they're still going to have sin in their life. They're still going to fail the Lord from time to time. But they're not going to be carnally minded. Okay? When they start, when you, before I got saved and I started seeking the Lord, He started showing me truth. Why? Because I was seeking Him. If someone's not seeking Him, they don't care about truth. Okay? Verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God has likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. There's still people out there who do drawings and everything, okay, which is a sin. What's the image of the Godhead? Jesus Christ. Are we allowed to draw images of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. We have all these actors. I'm going to play Jesus Christ. It's blasphemy. Okay, it's satanic and it's wicked. Verse 30. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Remember what I talked about in some of my other studies, brothers and sisters Christ. No change life, no change life gospel is a resurrectionless gospel. The old man is supposed to be dead and buried with Christ, crucified with Christ. God gives you a new life. The new man comes up and is raised with Christ. There's no resurrection in your life. There's no new birth. You're not a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're not saved. You you believe with the life that you're living. You believe in a resurrectionless gospel. He's preaching the resurrection. Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, 
among the which was Dionysus the Aragopite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with him, with them. Sorry. So there's the three responses you're going to get. I believe you, you try twice. Okay? If you really want to go out of your way to try twice, by all means, go ahead. Today we're dealing with people that have a preconceived idea of who Jesus is, but it doesn't line up with Scripture. They have a preconceived idea, but it's the Jesus that they worship is foreign to Scripture. The King James Bible, Scripture. Okay? The Jesus they worship is an antichrist. It's an antichrist spirit deceiving them into believing that it's Jesus. Okay. But you're going to have three reactions. You're going to have people who mock you. I've had people mock me. I still have people to this day make videos mocking the Word of God. They think they're mocking me, but they're mocking the Word of God. If I'm wrong somewhere, by all means, come talk to me and use Scripture. Comparing Scripture with Scripture. Don't just take one thing out of context. Compare Scripture with Scripture. But I still have people to this day that still mock me. They can't handle truth. They can't refute truth. In other words, they can't prove me wrong with the scriptures, so they just mock me. That's not something Christians should be doing. We shouldn't be mocking as Christians. That's something the lost world does, not Christians. That's something God Almighty, who is the only one that has the right to do it, is going to be doing. We're not supposed to be mocking. But that's one of the reactions you're going to get. Someone mocks. Someone will be like, well, it sounds good. But I'm not ready yet. I'll hear thee again of, that, of this matter. What did Paul do? I said this in other studies. What did Paul do? So Paul departed from among them. He didn't sit there trying to hammer him. No, you got to get saved. No, i got to tell you this again. i got to tell you this again. i got to tell you this. No, he departed. He told them once. And he departed. The third reaction you're going to get from people is they believed. You're going to get people that you're going to lead to the truth. Praise the Lord. And give God all the glory. But those are the three reactions you're going to get. How forceful should you be? I believe you should go out of your way once. Maybe a lot later down the road, you'll go out of your way the second time. But after that, it's between them and the Lord. Now, I don't, that's when you going out of your way to get in front of them to preach the gospel to them. I'm not talking about doors. You might have preached it twice to them, but God might, they might come back later and God opens a door. And they start asking you questions. Those people that says, we'll hear thee again of this matter. They might come back to you three months down the road, a year down the road, and start asking you questions about Jesus, about the Bible version issue. And that's an open door. That doesn't count as the two. I'm talking about he that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. When you try to preach truth to, to these false converts and to the world as a whole, okay, Paul, because people say, well, that's only people that are heretics. Okay, someone who says there is no God, that's a heretic. Okay, uh, all these false religions out there, they're heretics. Okay, that's why we use that verse. Okay, someone who rejects Jesus Christ and wants nothing to do with them and they'll have their excuses, their excuses makes them a heretic. Because they make it out there as their excuses as justification to go to hell and then into the lake of fire to burn for all of eternity. There is no excuse to do that. So two times, okay, is the most I would do. I like I said, my um, my mom, professing Christian, I tried preaching the plan of salvation to her. I tried to preach to her about the uh, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, trying to explain to her that look how bad the world's getting. We're getting closer to the catching away of the body of Christ. You're going to get left behind. If you don't get saved. And it got to the point where I'm not allowed to discuss religious matters with her at this point. That's the way it happens. There's now a wall between us. I'm not allowed to discuss religious matters with her. I'm only allowed to call up and say, ask her how she's doing health-wise. Pretty much it. Okay. Some people will mock. In other words, I don't want to hear it. You're just, you're just a fruitcake. I don't want to hear it. You're going to have people say, I'll hear thee again of this matter. And you'll have some people that will believe. Those are your three reactions. But you're not supposed to waste your time trying to cast pearls and um, that which is holy. When you talk in the Bible about holy, you know what holy is? It's God's commands. The holy commandments of God. That's what holy is. When Jesus said, be ye holy as I am holy, Jesus, when he came and walked in the likeness of sinful flesh, he was capable of sin, but he never sinned. 
He obeyed all of God's commands. Be ye holy as I am holy. You're not supposed to cast that which is holy into the dogs. The Lord says this. The Lord says that. There's no point if they reject Jesus Christ. Okay, we preach the plan of salvation. You're going to go to the, the Lord's God says that you're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity if you die in your sins. You've sinned against an almighty righteous God. You're sick. Okay, that sickness is sin. You do that. But when it comes to trying to preach the major doctrines like Godhead, um, pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ, the millennial kingdom, uh, there's no point in discussing it with someone who's lost. Just the plan of salvation. And even then, once, twice, I'm done. There was times where, until someone pointed this out to me, I used to do the three-strike rule. Three strikes and you're out. Not that I'm into sports, but it's just something that was in my head from uh, baseball. Three strikes, you're out. So I'd try three times, and then I'd be like, I'm done. But the Bible actually says two. Okay. So, but the, don't get confused by what I'm saying when I say that there should be open doors. Every once in a while, you're going to see an open door. You might have preached the gospel to the person twice, and all of a sudden they come back, you see that they have a different demeanor. God has broken them somehow, and they start asking questions. That's an open door. Uh, there's times where God will open, open doors where they come to you, and I don't count that as the one or two times. If they come to you asking questions because they want answers, by all means, give them answers. Don't just say, oh, I've already told him twice, I'm not answering any of these questions. Try to answer some of his questions. But be careful that you don't fall in the trap of those that are asking questions to just ask questions. They're trying to mess you up. They're trying to get you to turn away from the Word of God. They're trying to get you to doubt His perfect written Word. You need to break that conversation off and say, I'm done. There's a difference between someone asking a question, one or two questions, and saying, oh, that's good, I'm going to go think on these things. Then someone who just asks question, 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 question. And they're asking questions faster than you can even answer the questions. Uh, that's not somebody that's looking for truth. I wouldn't give that person the time of day. <laughs> well, I give them the time of day, but I mean when it comes to the Bible. That, that whole saying, I wouldn't give them the time of day, doesn't mean you wouldn't tell them what time it is. It's saying, I wouldn't spend time to talk to him about the Bible because he's not really wanting truth. He's trying to find a loophole. He's trying to find... Out, he's trying to get me to be wrong, which I can be, and the moment he finds me wrong somewhere, like I don't have the answer for everything, he uses that or she uses that as justification to ignore everything. That's those types of people that ask questions nonstop. They're waiting to find a loophole. They're waiting to find a question that you can't answer, so then it just proves everything you said, and it doesn't. It's, it's, it's madness. Okay? Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, the Bible says. So be careful about those people. But that's how I'd answer that. Once or twice, and those are the three types of reactions you're going to get from people when you try to preach truth to them. Okay. Uh, the fourth question he asks. He, I say he, but I forgot to put the name down. So if it's a sister in Christ, please forgive me. I didn't put the name down on the, on the notes. I just want to say brother in Christ or sister in Christ. Okay. Brethren. But the fourth one, it says, You said in a prior video that sometimes you struggle with and eventually overcome overcame was the sin of porn pornography. I too struggle with it. I am quite certain now that by the grace and mercy of God I've permanently overcome it. My problem is that even after overcoming it and not looking for it anymore, it clings to my mind still in my dreams and in my thoughts. All of a sudden I'll all of a sudden, it'll all just come back to me even now. The wicked things I saw rush back to the front of my mind. Do they ever stop? That's the question mark. Do they ever stop? Okay. The Bible, if we get to it, yeah, it's down here. We'll get to some verses in the Bible, and I'll answer that. The answer is no. Why? Uh, you can try to drown it out with truth. Where you spend most of your time, that's what's going to be on your mind, and that's what's going to be in your heart. When God gets the sin and the bad addictions out of your life, you drown it out with good things, good addictions. This being the number one addiction, the Word of God. Okay. But how wicked this world is, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, someone said, I have it down here, I'll have to repeat it again though, we will have to bear the scars of our sins in this life. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. There's a reason for that. You get wicked stuff up here, it's hard to get it out. 
And it, there's times where I'm like, I think I got it completely out. I don't even think about video games, movies, t Hollywood movies, TV shows, or porn. And somehow something, just out of the blue, something reminds me of it. Of any of those sins or any of those addictions. You go into town, you see a modestly dressed woman. Any kind of thing could just try to bring that back. It's going to be a constant struggle to the day you die, brothers and sisters of Christ. There is no, um, I'm, I get, God gets the sin out, and then I don't even, I don't have to struggle with it anymore. You're going to be struggling with it to the day you die. Okay, but we're going to get to some scriptures to help us with that. Will they be taken away before the great white throne judgment? Remember, the judgment seat of Christ. There's two throne judgments. It's the same throne. It's just different time periods. The judgment seat of Christ is going to happen at the catching away of the body of Christ during the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe that. Okay? And then the great white throne is at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Satan is let loose for a little while and um, he destroys the, the old heaven and the old earth and creates the new heaven and new earth. And before that, in that in between, that's when everybody's being judged. Death and hell are brought up and everybody's being judged. All the lost world. Okay? So make sure it's the judgment seat of Christ for saved sinners. And yes, he says, the Bible says that God's going to wipe away every tear. We're going to have the mind of Christ. I do believe that God will get um, these thoughts out of our heads to the point where we won't have them. Okay. Verse 1, and if someone has a scripture to prove me wrong, by all means do scripture. But I believe it's going to get to a point when we get our incorruptible. Notice it said, in, the Bible says this corruption must put on in corruption means we're not capable of being corrupted anymore. We don't have to put up with this body of flesh that keeps tempting us and causing us to stumble and fall. Okay. I want them to go away, as do I, brother or sister in Christ. I do too. But they just keep coming back. Do you suffer from this at all anymore, or did you ever struggle from this problem? I still struggle with temptation for video games. Boy, do I struggle. One minute I'm sitting there talking to the Lord about something, and out of the blue, whatever I'm talking about reminds me of a video game. I start thinking of that video game for the next five minutes. Just I'm in the middle of talking to the Lord, and it just hits me. And then the Lord corrects me and says, you're starting to daydream, and your thoughts are starting to be on things that shouldn't be. Oh, Lord, you're right. Lord, get this out of my head, Lord. Please forgive me. Where did we leave off, Lord? Okay, we were talking about this, Lord, and I get back to what I was talking to the Lord about. It happens a lot. Okay. Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man and great... Man, the wickedness, wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's the thoughts of our hearts. When you're lost... Uh, if you got saved when you're young, praise the Lord. If you got saved like me when you're older, there's a lot of sin you put through this brain of yours. Okay, uh, that you didn't abstain from all appearance of evil. But the imagine of the uh, the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Why do I read this verse? Because there's a verse that we're going to get to that talks about how we're supposed to bring our thoughts into subjection to the obedience of Christ. Our thoughts are always going to try to stray. Our thoughts are always going to try to go to wicked things. And we've got to bring and rein in our thoughts to the obedience of Christ. Okay? First, that's, uh, we, and remember what I said before. We will have to bear the scars of the sins in this life. Okay? There's a constant struggle to the day you die with sin. With the temptation of sin. The flesh. There's always going to be a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Because they are contrary one to the other, the Bible says. Okay? There's always going to be a struggle. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Why does God say that? Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Why does God say that? He says it for a reason. Because He knows when it gets in here, it's hard to get it out. Especially if it's visual images, like video games are designed, designed to be addictive. There's no such thing as a clean video game. It's all designed to be addictive and get it stuck up here. And it gets in the way of this. Okay. Uh, same thing with Hollywood movies and TV shows. Same thing with sexual perversion. Okay. It messes you up to get in the, so this isn't that effective. But it says abstain from all appearance of evil. Why? Because when it's visual, appearance, appearance, when it's visual, it gets burned in our head. 
You ever heard that saying, I wish I could unsee that? I, I, there's a lot of things I wish I could have unseen in my life. As a, uh, I wish I'd have gotten saved sooner, and I wouldn't have seen some of the things I've seen. Got messed up in some of the sins that I did. Right? Second Corinthians 10.5 says, Casting down imaginations. That's what I have to keep doing. I have to keep casting down those imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay? And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I like reading that one because it's talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. When our obedience is fulfilled, we get caught up. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mort mortal must put on immortality. Okay? We get caught up. And we come back with Jesus Christ for the thousand year reign. If you suffer with him, he shall also reign with him. We have to be ready to uh, revenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. That's what that's talking about. We need to work hard to keep obeying the word of God. And one of the things God warns us about is that you're just talking about and asking the questions. Your mind is going to st astray and you're going to start thinking of things that you're not supposed to be thinking about. And you've got to get them out. Okay, you've got to bring them into the subjection of Christ. Do I still struggle with those things? What I mean by overcome in my life means that I'm not doing the physical act. Okay, but remember what the Bible says, if you thought it, or if you take pleasure in those that do it also, you're just as guilty. But the point is when we say, a lot of us brethren say that we've got it out of our lives, God's got, not us, God's got it out of our life, we're talking about the physical act. But that temptation still always keeps creeping in all the time tries to sneak in when you least expect it I'm, like I said there's times I'm in the middle of praying to God talking to the Lord and I start thinking of a movie and I start going through the whole movie in my head and I just start going into imaginations for the next five ten minutes and the Lord's like stops me do you see what just happened there I said Lord you're right I don't know how that happened please forgive me Lord what we were talking about, okay, yes, we were talking about this Bible study, we were talking about this going on in the world, and we get back, I get back to talking to the Lord. That's why the Bible tells us, even with our thoughts, we have to have the same attitude of denying ourselves, picking up our cross daily, and get back to where you left off talking with the Lord. Back to following Jesus Christ, okay? What helps me when these thoughts come in? Talking to the Lord, praying to the Lord, okay? Singing hymns is a big one. That's why I brought this right here. I've got this. I had to throw away two hymnal books because they had bad songs in them that were Antichrist spirit songs. Um, so I find one that I think has some good hymns in it. But I really, what I like to do instead of trying to hunt down books, book hymnals, I like printing out hymns, old hymns that I've tried by the Bible, tried by fire, <laughs> the fire, <laughs> tried with the Word of God, and they bait their, they are biblical hymns, and I type them up, and I. Uh, have them sitting here beside my bed, and I'll take them. I'll go sit outside and sing to the Lord sometimes outside. You can take them and go for a walk and sing to the Lord. Uh, you start memorizing hymns. and have this. I, I try to sing a hymn every other night or almost every night if I can. And if I don't forget to sing a hymn just as I read my Bible every night. The other thing is reading the Bible. If you start getting tempted, read the Bible. Do some hymns. Memory verses. We talked about those. That helps you when, you when those temptations come in. But lately, more than anything, the Lord just really convicts my heart. And He helps me get back on the right track. Lord, I'm sorry for my mind wandering. I'm going to get back to focusing on You. But there are times where I have to start quoting scriptures. There's times where I've got to go put, put in a Bible study by one of the brothers in Christ and start following along in my King James Bible and do some highlighting. Something to distract me from that temptation. All right? Sometimes it can get that bad. I did a video once showing how, and I, I'm, not bad, I'm a bad actor, but I want people to see what I do sometimes when temptation gets really, really rough. And I'll drop everything here, jump in my truck, and go walk on the beach, and pull out these memory cards, and start talking to the Lord and reading the scriptures. I get away from the temptations. You see, since, I had, since my biggest addictions are video games, movies, Hollywood movies and TV shows, and uh, porn, used to be porn in the, bat, in the past, um, it's that computer. So what do I do? I try to get away from the computer. And that's why I did that whole video where I grabbed Victoria and we jumped to the truck 
and I tried to videotape us driving to the beach, and I videotaped us running around the beach. I videotaped me uh, using this, not putting on a show. I wanted you guys to see what I actually do all the time. You'll be shocked at how often I do this. How often I go for a walk around here just to talk with the Lord and get away from all temptation. Okay? Um, so, singing hymns and pull out your memory verses. Go for a walk and talk with the Lord. Explain... Uh, I already did that. Explain the jump in the truck. <laughs> Brother Brian has a great study on porn addiction that works with any addiction. Okay, he has a great old audio study on it. And the thing is, is the biggest thing, if you don't can't get to it right now, is you replace bad addictions with good addictions. You keep your hands busy, physical work to do with your hands that keep you busy and keep you doing good things and keep you away from the bad things. If you just say, I'm going to quit all those bad things, and then you just sit here and you start twiddling your thumb, guess what's going to happen? You're going to go right back to those bad things. But if you say, Lord, help me, and the Lord said, okay, start doing an hour to two hour long Bible study every day. Start your day, end your day with reading a chapter. Start making these. Uh, memory verses, start getting some gospel tracts to go gospel tracting. Uh, he's blessed me with a garden. Every morning uh, during the spring to fall, I have a garden that I get to take care of, praise the Lord. He's blessed me with chickens. He's blessed me with this property that I have to keep up and do physical work. I'm learning how to fish and how to hunt to provide food that's free. And um, I get to buy a fishing license. Um, but it's very little. But I'm saying it's very inexpensive and um, it's healthy. So he's trying to keep me busy, keep me learning different trade skills to keep me busy. Okay, it's very important. Okay, you trade the old addiction, the bad addiction, for a good addiction. And the number one good addiction you need to have is for the a love for God's word. Uh, when he was trying to get me away from all that junk, I was doing three. Four hour Bible studies a day. I was going for walks, and the Lord really had to smack me upside the head to say, Hey, you need to start doing some good uh, addictions that you can give God glory in and give God thanks in. Gardening, growing your own food, absolutely. You give God thanks for that. The chickens, eggs, taking care of them, absolutely. You can start learning woodworking, uh, trade skills, you know. Uh, contracting, stuff like that, that keeps you busy. That you can give glory to God with the works of your hand. Okay. You cannot give God the, any glory with the works of your hands when it comes to video games. Just got to throw that in there. because People still think you can. It's like, they're addicted. They're just so addicted. They can't give it up to save their lives. And for some of them, I, I think that it, it would save their life because I don't believe they're saved. That's a whole other issue. Okay? It's not that you have sin in your life that makes me think people are lost. It's their attitude towards sin that really get to me and break my heart. Because I want them to be saved. I don't go looking into somebody wanting them to be lost. Okay, if anybody's ever said that, they're lying. I never go into looking at somebody who professes to be saved saying, I hope they're lost, I hope they're lost. That's not it. It's just when you see their attitude towards this book change, because their attitude towards sin is different than it should be according to this book, and you start backing them in a corner with this book, their attitude towards the book changes. And you find out they got saved off of easy believism or whatever. Sorry to go off on a sidetrack. But, okay, replacing bad addiction with good addictions. The more you put good things before your eyes and hide them in your heart, the more the bad things fade away. Okay? They will still appear from time to time. Like I said, they fade away. I don't get tempted by video games all day, every day anymore. God's got a lot of it out. I get tempted probably once or twice a week now. Something will get me to remember a movie or a, t a video game or something. And mainly if I'm sitting there idle, that's when I start getting the temptation when I'm sitting there being very idle, not doing anything. All right. Proverbs 23, 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. And people like to end there, but there's more to that verse. It's very important. You buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. In other words, you buy the truth and sell it not. You buy wisdom and sell it not. You buy instruction and sell it not. And you buy understanding and sell it not. Wisdom is not the same thing as intelligence. Somebody can memorize this book verse by verse, and that's very they're very intellectual, but they don't have any wisdom. 
because they don't know how to apply this to their life. Okay, wisdom is actual life application. Buy wisdom and sell not. You can only get wisdom is if you start working. You want to be a great carpenter? You need to start working with wood. You need life experience. You want to be a good gardener? You need life experience. You want to be a good person with livestock? Whatever. You need life experience. You want this to work in your life? then you need to start applying it to your life so you can start having life experience. That's why the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You hide God's word in your heart, that means you're doing your best to apply it to your life. And you start getting life experience. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's through Jesus Christ and His perfect written word that God gives us the instructions on how to overcome sin in our life. And gives us the strength to overcome sin. I'm not capable of doing it on my own. And it's thanks to with instruction. Okay, people are giving instructions. I've, I've had times where I've told people, hey, this helps you. Make some flashcards. It helps you with sin. To fight sin. And they keep calling me up every week. Oh, I failed the Lord again. I failed the Lord again. I said, did you make that flashcard? Oh, no, I haven't really made the flashcards yet. I'm like, are you reading your Bible every day? I'm like, look, well, sometimes. I, it's like all these instructions I'm given that God showed and proved in my life, it works. I'm a testament. I have a testimony that it works, if I can say it right. And yet they, they, they don't, they're not taking my instruction. I've seen that. For it to work, you've got to take instructions. Buy instruction and sell it not. Buy wisdom and sell it not. Okay? Buy understanding and sell it not. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you fear the Lord in your life, life application, you will get wisdom. But knowledge of the Holy is understanding. He's given you a perfect written word of God, King James Bible. Take it or leave it. A lot of people say leave it. So you can have understanding. He's given us His word so we can have understanding. Okay. The fifth question He asks... Okay, that's what I do. You start getting temptations, they come in, you've got to get them out as fast as they come in. Bring your thoughts into objection to the beings of Christ. Memory verses, hymns, okay? Memory verses, hymns. Get away from whatever that temptation is. Go out and go for a walk, talk with the Lord. There's times, brothers and sisters of Christ, that it was pouring down rain, and I was being tempted really bad, that I just grabbed Victoria, my mentor Schnauzer, and I jumped in the truck, and I drove down to this spot where you can pull and park really close to the ocean and I cracked the window so you could just hear the ocean because with the rain you really can't see much through the windshield I cracked the windshield window so I could hear the ocean and I played some Bible studies on my little tablet that I've got. I played Bible studies and sat in the truck and I spent most of the day sitting by the beach while it's pouring down rain in a truck because I wanted to get away from the temptation here because that computer's right there. The internet can get you in so much trouble. There are times where you're going to have to do that. Doesn't matter how great of a man of God you people think you are, you're still going to have to do it to this day. You're going to have to get away from the temptations and get out and go for a walk. All right. People always wonder why I spend most of my days outdoors during the spring, summer, and fall. I spend all my time sitting on the deck. I eat my breakfast on the deck. I eat my lunch on the deck. I eat my dinner on the deck. I sit out there and listen to Bible studies on the deck. I talk with the Lord on the deck. I listen to wordless music so I can pray and talk with the Lord out loud. I listen to Alexander Scorby while sitting on the deck. I watch the sun go down. Why do you spend so much time outside? Because I want to stay away from that computer. I want to stay away from that temptation. If I had a house church, I keep praying and praying. If I had a house church here, I don't know if I would do it. I'd probably quit the internet. I'd, I'd let a brother in Christ that doesn't have the struggles that I have um, can do audio studies and put them online by all means. But if I had a house church here, you know, 10 people that shows up once a week to listen to the Word of God and we have different men preaching, um, I don't know if I'd spend much time on the, comu on the computers I do. I just... It's just a big temptation. When you're looking at someone who's a huge gamer, and uh, online games, and all kinds of stuff, it's an addiction. And you've got to stay away from anything that will tempt you into those addictions. Right? You've got to do whatever it takes to keep your eyes and your head, mind 
your th thoughts and imagination, and your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. You do whatever it takes. Right? Uh, a good example, someone said, well, I, I still have the Xbox, and it can play DVDs, and I got rid of my Hollywood movies, but I have some good DVDs that are Christian DVDs, um, so I just keep it and I use it for that, and I told I said, no, you don't. Well, it's just, it, I'm not using it. I said, you don't do it. It's a temptation. That box is standing there staring at you in the face day in and day out. It's a temptation. And the guy had to finally admit, brother in Christ, he's like, yeah, it is a temptation. And yeah, I've kind of slipped up because I, I didn't know you could play games without DVDs on some of those. They go on the internet now and act like a computer. Um, yeah, I failed the Lord a couple times. Yeah, it's, 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 I said, destroy it. Take it out, put a hammer to it, and throw it away. You do whatever it takes to get that temptation out of your life. Okay? You do whatever it takes. It is that serious. God takes it serious, and God's very serious about helping you get it out of your life. He's just as serious about getting sin out of your life as he is of how bad sin is. People don't seem to get that. They think, well, God's just so hard on sin. He's so hard on getting you out of sin, too. He's provided a way out. Right. So the last question he asks, says here, for, fifth question, could you please talk about alcohol for a moment? I definitely understand that drunkenness is a sin, but what about drinking in moderation? Okay. Here's the biggest thing. When you're talking about drunkenness and you're talking about drinking in moderation, they always try to be careful of people who always try to slam them back together. And hear, what, hear me what I'm saying. My experience with people that are drunkards, they always try to bring it back to moderation. Well, we're allowed to have wine in moderation. When you're talking about drunkenness, you don't talk about moderation. You talk about drunkenness. Okay? It's a sin. It's wrong. You're not to get drunk, period. You don't turn around and tell people, but I know you can drink in moderate. No. A drunkenness is a sin, and you hammer it hard. Drunkenness is a sin. Okay? Now, when someone tells you drinking wine is a sin, that's when it's a different subject. If someone just says, hey, drinking wine at all is a sin, that's a different subject. If someone's trying to crack down on drunkenness, you don't talk, talk about how it's okay to drink wine. You tell them about how it's wrong to be drunk. Okay, the Bible says be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil will walk around like a roaring lion seeking whom he de may devour. Roaming around like a roaring lion. See, the roaming or walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We're told to be sober time and time again in the Bible. Be not drunken. Okay? Especially for health benefits, whether for... Re for a remedy, like in 1 Timothy 5.23, if it was sinful to drink at all, then it wouldn't be of use to the body, and Paul certainly wouldn't be telling Timothy to drink it. Okay, I do find it interesting that obviously Timothy was abstaining from it since Paul had to tell him to drink it. Okay, He didn't want nothing to do with it. That's a good point. Also, another verse of interest is, in Luke 7, 33 and 34, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and we and ye say, he hath the devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Is Jesus saying that he drinks wine here? Yes, he is. We're going to get into that. Okay. What kind of wine is he drinking? That's the important part. People think wine automatically, alcohol, wine, alcohol, wine. Is it wine that's strong wine? Because the Bible talks about strong wine or new wine. Or is it fermented grape juice? Okay. Does it have alcohol? There's a difference in the Bible. But people don't like to point out that difference. Also, looking at the marriage at Canaan, John... 2, chapter 2, verse 11, And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, not drunken, just drunk, or drank, you know, like this tea right here, I can have tons of this tea and be well drunk, but I'm not drunken, because there's no alcohol in this. It's uh, hot tea. It's mint tea. Praise the Lord. Um... 
and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse... But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, if the guy was drunk, would he be able to tell the difference between the good and the bad? No. I, I can speak from experience. No. I'm not promoting this, but we used to buy the... When I was in the military, I got drunk several times. And they used to buy the expensive liquor. And then when they couldn't afford the expensive liquor, they would buy the cheap liquor. And when we had finished off the expensive, we'd buy the cheap. And you couldn't tell the difference when you do it that direction when you talk about drunkenness. We couldn't tell the difference. We're drunk. Okay. This guy could tell the difference. So is this wine that has alcohol in it? I don't believe it does. Okay. That's the difference here. Okay. Being that the word is good, the word is good wine instead of new wine, doesn't that mean it's alcoholic and has fr and has fermented. Remember, we're going to read a verse in here that talks about when new the people said, "Oh, these guys are have new wine." There's a difference between new wine. New wine has two two meanings. Okay, fermented grape juice or new wine is the alcoholic grape juice, where its wine is new. And if you've ever heard the saying, because I'm getting ahead of myself, you need to let it breathe. It's new. You need to let it breathe. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay, but this says. Good wine, and when men have drunk, when that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Notice it didn't say new wine. It said, or strong wine. It said good wine. This stuff is amazing. I've had grape juice that's like the stuff you get from the stores that's like, eh. And then I've had grape juice that's fresh, squeezed, made grape juice. And it's amazing. Okay. There's a difference. You can tell a difference. Okay. I've, uh, neighbors taught me how to make apple juice. I bought apple juice from the store and it was, uh, but when I learned how to make fresh apple juice, you boil it, you put can, you put it in jars, and then you put it in a steamer to steam it and help seal the jar. When you go to open that jar later and you go to drink that apple juice, I was like, wow, this is not like that junk that you get from the store. Not at all. Okay. You could tell a difference. That's all I believe is going on here. Because okay? Jesus isn't sitting there promoting drunkenness. I mean, think about it, brothers and sisters of Christ. He's not sitting there promoting drunkenness. Okay? He wouldn't tell us drunk, being drunk is a sin, yet I'm going to sit here and promote drunkenness at this wedding. No, he wasn't promoting drunkenness. It's just regular wine, fermented grape juice, non-alcoholic or not enough alcohol in there, period, because sometimes the fermenting process will leave a, 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 such a small percent, it's just not funny, it's not even worth recognizing. It's not going to affect you. Okay. Last verse, Proverbs 31, 6 and 7. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. I, a lot of people grab this and think it's just a, it's, he's, he's depressed. We're going to keep reading. And wine unto those that be of a heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. On the alcohol... Okay, stop right there, because that's the verse. Okay, Here's the thing. What does the Bible say about the time of Jacob's trouble? There's going to be men's hearts failing them for fear. I still believe this is talking about medically. Okay, well, how do you get that? You take a little sh glass. I'm talking about a little, like, the smallest wine glass you can find. Um, a little wine glass, I mean really small, it's like a shot glass on top of a wine glass, really small, of red wine for people that are having heart problems. Okay, Met, talk about the time of Jacob's troubles, men's hearts failing them for fear. Okay, you're having poverty, you're going through hard times in life and certain men, their hearts aren't doing so good. Well here, take a little bit of this red wine when you before you go to bed every night. It'll help strengthen your heart and help you with your heart. It's a good thing, okay? It's medicine. I believe it's talking about medicine. But people will say, well, this means that anytime I'm depressed, I can drink. What does that lead to? It leads to drunkenness. Complete and utter drunkenness. I've had my ex-wife try to use both the verse up there about uh, Timothy, 
Drink a little wine for thy often stomach's sake infirmities. If I can say it right. Um, I think I probably still said it wrong a little bit. And then she'll run to this verse here, Proverbs 31, 6, 7. Well, I was depressed, so that justifies drinking. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about having a heavy heart. Having so much stress of this world crushing in on your heart to the point where you're starting to have panic attacks and heart attacks. Take a little bit of the red wine. That'll help you with your heart so you don't have heart attacks. Okay. Little. <laughs> okay. That's why it's talking about that when it says give strong drink. It's talking about the red wine for medicine. Same thing for the bot for the stomach sake and furnace. I believe that's talking about the strong drink, the strong wine. Okay? Because the alcohol in there helps reset your stomach. And I forgot to bring it in here for this study. But um, I use apple cider vinegar. There's substitutes for doing it. You don't have to mess with wine at all, period. There's substitutes for it. Okay? There's substitutes for it. Um, on the alcohol question, what do you maintain? What verse, verses back up your view? Okay, we're going to go through some verses. Okay, but back up your view. How do you explain these verses? Okay, I already tried to explain to them. They're talking about medically. Okay, uh, the Wild West, the reason people were taking shots, and a lot of them got drunk, started falling into drunkenness. But that's how they cleanse their stomach. Being out there, not drinking, just drinking water that's not filtered or nothing, just drinking water from the streams and the lakes and everything. They'd come back and you take a little shot every once in a while to help kill the bad bacteria in your stomach and help cleanse it. Okay, it's medical. But what happens when you take something that's medical and you abuse it? Okay, what do I stand? For? What I mean is, is I've talked to some brethren. I said, be careful of temporary solutions. When it comes to the medical career, uh, medical field, as far as you know, the pharmaceutical companies and everything, be careful of temporary solution. In other words, it just manages the symptoms or hides the symptoms, but it doesn't solve the problem. Painkillers, okay. My ex-wife, she was in a serious accident. Uh, uh, I think it was a second-story um, deck fell out from under him, and she broke a lot of bones hurt herself really bad. She had to go through therapy, heal her body. She had to do a lot of exercising to get back to where she could physically do what she could do before the accident. But she said she lived in chronic pain. So instead of finding a permanent solution to help her through that, she felt that she went with drunkenness and smoking weed to hide the pain. It just numbed the pain so she didn't feel it, but the pain was still there. Be careful with that. Okay, when Paul said, "Have a little uh, wine for thy often sake, stomach sake infirmities," he's saying you take a little bit of it to fix the stomach problem. The stomach problem is fixed. You stop taking it. That's the part, the point I've always pushed with the brethren. You when it comes for medical purposes, you take it to fix the problem, not hide it. I know, of brethren, that they get pills or this or that that just numb the body so you don't feel the pain anymore and that makes it okay. No, it doesn't. Okay? You're not fixing the problem. You're just hiding it. And it becomes an addiction. That's what turns into an addiction. Okay? But I believe both those verses, um, 1 Timothy 5.23 and Proverbs 31.6.7 is talking about a medical condition. One's for the stomach, one's for the heart. Alright? I honestly don't know what your view is on the matter. I do know that you were designated driver for four years in, I believe, North Dakota. I wasn't sure if those years as a designated driver signify you view or not. No, in North Dakota, in my testimony video, in North Dakota, and I've said it in other videos, I was a designated driver, professing Christian, designated driver, and like I said, I went to the bars where the women were dancing, and the guys were getting drunk, and I was sitting in the back drinking uh, sodas. Like um, I can't remember the names of the sodas. There's, there's uh, my brain just froze on all of them. Coca-Cola. Let's say that one. So I was playing blackjack. I just did it because I was told morally it's getting drunk is bad, and you really shouldn't do it, and drunk's not good. But it wasn't. I was a fake Christian. But when I 
got stationed in North Dakota for four years. Then I went out to um, Okinawa for another three years. And while I was out there, that's when I started getting drunk myself. Okay, I started drinking uh, beers and liquor, and I got drunk. So I understand that's where he's getting that, he or she's getting that, because I've said that before in studies. I've made, as a, like I said, when I go to hand out gospel tracts, brothers and sisters of Christ, when I go to hand out a gospel tract, and they say, oh, I'm a Christian, I, I look at them and go, so was I before I was saved. <laughs> and it just totally takes them by surprise. What? Yeah, I was a professing Christian too before I was saved. Yeah, but, but we go to this Babel building, so did I before I was saved. I remember Peter Hookman talking about that in one of his testimonies. So was I. I did. You know, I was a Christian too before. I, I was a professing Christian too before I was saved. I, I was just a worthless wretch of a man. I was just disgusting in God's eyes, trying to profess to be a Christian when I wasn't. Okay. Now I want to go through some things real quick. I do want to go through some of the scriptures. So let's go through Luke chapter seven, verse thirty-one. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what they are like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace, and calling one to another, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. Because you've got to read this. This is who he's talking about in this verse that he, this brother mentioned earlier. Verse 33, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath a devil. In other words, the world's trying to pipe to us, and the world wants us to dance to its tune. The world wants Jesus to dance to its tune, conform to the world. Jesus said, I am conformed to the world. What does the Bible say? Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is talking about how John wouldn't conform, so they called they they said, For John the Baptist came neither eating neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath the devil. He wouldn't conform. He called out the Pharisees. He wouldn't conform. Verse thirty four The Son of Man is come eating and drinking. The same thing you said John wouldn't do, he's doing. And ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Now you bring this up. Bread and drinking wine. Okay, and then people kind of get, get to where it says, Gluttonous man and a wine-bibber. Well, wine-bibber means they're just saying he's a drunkard. No, it isn't. Words have meaning. Okay, we'll get into the definitions here in just a second. Words have meaning. I'll read the definition in a second, but you said bread, drinking wine. Gluttonous means you're overeating. You're indulging the flesh by overeating. It's just food. But what is the term for when you overdrink? You're drinking all these exotic drinks. They're not alcohol, but they're drinks that are expensive. There's drinks that you don't normally drink on a day-to-day -day basis. Like today in America, we live like kings. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. There used to be certain types of food that everybody would eat in an area because that's the type of food that would grow in that area. Okay, now we can eat any type of food. We can eat types of food from all over the world. The thing about drinking wine, people didn't drink a glass of wine with dinner every stinking night. You didn't do that. It's expensive. Wine bottle. There wasn't that many wine bottles to give out to begin with. Okay. It was only something you did on special occasions. You didn't have a big feast like we tend to do as Americans when we eat our dinners and whatnot. The Lord's been helping me eat less than my meals. But he's saying that, you know, a wine bibber is someone who drinks a lot of uh, drinks that you wouldn't normally drink on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, they're saying he's fleshly. He's living by the flesh. Okay. Acts 2, 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothed in tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And now hear we every man in our own tongue, not some weird tongue, known languages of the day, when we were born. Parthians and Medes and Ammonites, uh, or uh, Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus in Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya, Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome. Jewish and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, this men, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with el the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken, New wine, drunken. As ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. New wine can sometimes be referred to wine that has a lot of alcohol, but you have to have that saying that when you open it up, you need to let it breathe. In other words, you need to let some of that alcohol evaporate out so it's not as strong. Okay, I don't agree with drinking strong wine to begin with, unless you know, for, for medical reasons, but today there's a lot of alternatives, okay? Apple cider vinegar is one for the stomach, okay? There's other things out there you can do. Bread, eating good bread for the heart. It's good for man's heart. There's other ways of doing things medically that if you can, if you, can you can just stay away from alcohol, period. And I'll get into that in just a second, but gluttonous. Remember what we read up there? It says, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber calling out Jesus. I've had so many people also try to grab that verse and justify getting drinking and having fun because Jesus drank. It's not taught about drunkenness. Gluttonous. Consistent in excessive eating as gluttonous delight. That's what gluttonous is. Excessive eating. Do you ever get that bloated feeling, brother, sister, Christ? Sometimes it's bad food that gives you the bloated feeling, but there are times where you can eat good, healthy food and you get that bloated feeling. What's that bloated feeling? It's your body telling you that you're forcing yourself to eat too much. You're eating too much at one setting. I've had that feeling, especially when uh, the family comes together to do one big ho holiday uh, meal. You, and that's why a lot of people go and they take naps afterwards. Because you overate. Gluttonous. It's gluttony. Okay. That's what they're accusing say uh, they're, they're accusing Jesus of. Uh, someone who's just gluttonous and just just fleshly. They're trying to make him out to be a sinner, is the whole point. But what does wine bibber mean? According to Webster's 1828 dictionary, one who drinks much wine, a great drinker. You say, well, that could be drunkenness. It doesn't mention drunkenness at all. It's just one who drinks much wine, a great drinker. And you know the verse that it gives as an example? I, it caught me by surprise at first going, why would it use this verse as an example? Proverbs 23.1. Here's the definition of wine, bibber, of wine bibber. Okay, Proverbs 23.1 if you want to turn there. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what, it, what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Verse 3, be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Dainties. It's something that pirate people that it's considered a really treat. You know, there was a time period where chocolate, a little chocolate bar, it was very expensive and it was considered a delicacy. Now look at it today. It's everywhere. Chocolate everywhere. I watched a video on how chocolate was made. It's not easy. Um, but it used to be a delicacy. It's dainties. It's all about, ooh, pleasing the flesh. And all the rich people had, and the people high up had to have all these dainties. That's what it means by wine beer. It's just saying that 
People who know the, 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 the common person, the common man, did not drink wine left and right. They probably wouldn't even hardly get to drink wine at all. But Jesus is getting invited into this publican's house, this Pharisee's house. He's getting invited to these people, and he's being served bread and wine, and he's drinking. Okay, That's what's going on there. Uh, we just read about a time about new wine where the Bible uses the word drunken. These men aren't drunken as you suppose. You look at the word drunken, intoxicated, inebriated with strong liquor. Okay. Or, as the Bible says, strong wine. Given to drunkenness as a drunken butler. Three, saturated, saturated. You have to look up that word, saturated, okay? With liquor or moisture drenched. Uh, definition number four, proceeding from intoxication done in a state of drunkenness as a drunken quarrel. Drunken. Okay? That definition is not in wine bibber at all. Why? Because it's not about alcohol. It's just about him drinking Fermented grape juice that is, there's a limit about it. And only the people that have money, the, the, the people that are high society in this, have it. Okay, for the most part. It was an attack on Jesus Christ to say that he was fleshly, he's a sinner just like anybody else. They called John the devil because he called him out and wouldn't conform to the world. Jesus did the opposite of what John did and they still called him out. Why? Because it doesn't matter what you're doing, if you don't conform to this world, they're going to call you out. Period. If you don't go along with the system, the system that's falling apart and it's on its way to hell, the world's way is Satan's way, it's contrary to the Bible, and it's always leading people to hell. Okay? That's what's going on there. So please, please, don't fall into the trap of trying to use any verse in the Bible to justify drinking, just drinking, okay? There's times where it says, like I said, I believe it's for medical reasons, okay? Now, that being said, here's my stand on it as a whole. Is it okay? Because this day we have wine everywhere. Like I said, it used to be something that you had very rarely. Special occasions, and that's it, okay? When you were sick, you had the stronger wine. Okay, to help out with your stomach. But we don't need wine, strong wine for our stomach. But here's what I see, brother or sister in Christ, and to all the brothers and sisters in Christ out there to answer this question. Look in the world today. As we get closer and closer to the catching way of the body of Christ, is drunkenness becoming less of a problem or more of a problem? More of a problem. I mean, you can get alcohol anywhere now. They have alcohol in abundance everywhere. People are getting drunk all the time. Okay? Uh, it's just wickedness abounds in these last days. I've talked to brothers and sisters in Christ that have struggled with drunkenness and God has overcome it in their life. It's best just not to have alcohol, period. Okay? Paul said, if meat make my brother to offend, I'll eat no meat while the world standeth. I'll eat no meat while the world standeth. Did Paul eat meat? I believe he did. But the point is, is alcohol has gotten so out of control today, and there's so many brethren out there with testimonies, I'm one, of getting drunk, taking it too far, getting drunk, that it's best not to have anything to do with alcohol, period. I don't want to tempt the brethren and put a stumbling block in front of the brethren, and in and do, and so doing, sin against the brethren, which is sinning against God. I don't want to do that. So my thing is, is I just stay away from it, period. Okay? There's other ways to help out with the medical conditions with you, for your heart and for your stomach's sake. Okay? There's other ways to take care of that. You don't need alcohol. Okay? Is it, is it a sin to have a glass of wine that's uh, fermented grape juice? I do that. I do just grape juice or the fermented grape juice. Um, I forgot to mention this. I'm fermenting the food. The chicken's feed that I have, the chicken feed, I was told that if you ferment it, it puts some enzymes in there and it puts some minerals and vitamins in there that's great for the chicken. So what, right now, I am fermenting it and I stir it up and everything and it gets the bubbles and sometimes I can get that rotten egg smell <laughs> or that egg smell. And I'm mixing it up and everything and I keep it mixed up for three days, keep it, soak it in water and, and uh, mix it, mix it, and it starts 
it starts sucking in the water, it starts fermenting, and it starts getting all these vitamins that are good for the chickens. Now, my, are my chickens running around drunk and falling all over the place? No. Okay, just because it's fermented doesn't mean it's alcoholic. Okay. I was also going to show you guys, um, what is it? You have onions and then you have garlic. I was trying to think. Of, I have garlic where I have a jar of garlic where it's been pickled and it's fermented and they put some other stuff in it that's healthy and adds vitamins to it. And I, I just a clove. I just eat a clove a day from that jar and it helps with your health. Okay. Just because it says it's fermented doesn't mean it has alcohol. Sometimes there's a little bit of alcohol in the fermenting process, but by the time it's done, there is no alcohol. You look at how chocolate's made. Some chocolates, they use alcohol in the fermenting process, but by the time it's cooked, all the alcohol evaporates off, and there's no alcohol in it when you eat the chocolate. Okay? There's fermenting processes that use alcohol to ferment, but by the time it's done and it's ready to eat, there's no alcohol. So be careful when someone says, it's just because it's fermented grape juice, it has to have alcohol in it. No, it doesn't. No, it does not. My, my stand is this. I stay away from it because I had a problem with it in my past. I stay away from it because I know brethren out there have had problems with it in their past. Okay? I stay away from it because I know there's alternatives to medicine for the stomach's sake, infirmity, and for the heart. There's alternate medicines we can use. We don't have to go through alcohol. Stay away from the alcohol. Now, as far as grape juice, fermented grape juice, non-alcoholic grape juice that sometimes can be called wine, I'm okay with that. I drink grape juice, okay, a lot for breakfast. Okay? I'm, I'm okay with grape juice, especially fresh, homemade grape juice. It is amazing. Okay? healthy for you, good for you, and it's good to do grape juice with some bread. Sometimes I'll purposely do it for dinner. I'll do grape juice and bread and have uh, pears, black olives, you know, some little side stuff, but mainly the bread and the wine. And I'll sit there and I'll talk to the Lord saying and thank the Lord for everything he's gotten out of my life sin-wise. And I'll sit there and t ask the Lord, is there anything else that I need to do? Am I still doing something wrong? Do I need, still need to get some sin out of my life? That's what communion is all about evaluating your life to see how your walk is with the Lord. Is He going to be proud of you when He comes back? So, that's my stand on it. I don't touch it. I'm not going to call someone out as, as a, if they decide to take a little glass for their stomach and they take one glass, put it to this, they're done, it fixes their stomach, they're good to go, and they keep going. Am I going to down, down a brother or sister in Christ that does that? Absolutely not. If they take a little bit for their heart's sake, and then they put, the, they put the wine away because their heart's doing good. It's doing just fine. It's not something you constantly do. It's just something you do temporarily to fix the problem. And you get back to your walk with the Lord. I'm not going to down a Christian for doing that. I'm not going to say they're in sin. I'm not going to break fellowship with them. The problem is, is when you start doing it all the time. Most people can testify that today it's become a recreational thing. But people that have gotten into medicines that, that are supposed to help numb the pain and help out with the pain, they get addicted to it. So even when the pain is gone, the problem's been solved, they keep doing it. That's the problem. Okay. Drunkenness is a sin. That's what we need to focus on. I've, I'm sorry, I've had bad experiences with professing Christians that get drunk a lot and they try to use those verses to justify that it's okay to drink. When what they're really saying is, is they're using those verses to justify their sin, to justify drunkenness. When you're dealing with someone who's a drunkard, you focus on drunkenness as a sin. When you're dealing, on, dealing with medical stuff, about using wine for the stomach sake infirmity, for your heart, then just deal with that. You only have to bring them to, sometimes you have to warn them not to get drunk. Don't get addicted to it. But you mainly focus on medical purposes. Well, you don't have to do wine if you don't want to. You can do apple cider vinegar. Okay, uh, bread is really good for the heart. There's other things that are good for the heart. Okay, it has to do with what you have access to. Okay, so like I said, I'm not going to sit there and say someone's lost or break fellowship over someone who has a glass of wine for his stomach's sake, for the heart. I'm not going to do that. However, I will break fellowship with somebody professing Christian, whether they're saved or not, if they're getting drunk left and right. They're getting drunk, and then they try to justify it. 
They get drunk and then they try to justify it. I will break fellowship with someone like that. Okay, that's justification. The Bible talks about how you go and you correct that brother. Then you have two before two or three witnesses. Then you have the church go to them and they refuse because they're, they're wrong in the brethren when they're going out there saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and they're drunk on flat, on land, land flat face. My ex-wife would get drunk and that was the times that she loved to preach the gospel when she's drunk. Okay? She's offending the brethren and has wronged the brethren by getting drunk and pretending to be a Christian and trying to preach the gospel while drunk. I'm talking about drunk. Okay? That's where you go and talk to them and they don't repent. They don't get that drunkenness out of their life. You break fellowship with them. Sorry about that. Just there at the end, got a phone call. Um, brothers and sisters of Christ, uh, that's it for this series, of, for this very video. <laughs> Not really a series, but we're going to be doing a series. But this question and answer video, that's it we have for this. So remember, if you have any questions that you want to ask about the Word of God, okay, um, I have the channel, I'll link it down again, that there's a question and answer intro where you can ask questions. Okay. So I want to just end this by saying grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.